Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's free weekly e-newsletter, Unleashing Your Remarkable Potential, which is full of articles and resources to help you become a more confident and successful leader. Sign up by going to remarkablepodcast.com forward slash newsletter. And now here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Let me ask you a question. What is the state of your relationships in all areas of your life? I mean, do you feel like connecting is a lost art or at least one that you've lost your muscle memory on? Uh, If so, I promise you're in the right place. And we're going to talk about how to build more meaningful business relationships and any kind of relationships, really, in just a moment. But first, welcome to another live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I'm so glad that you're here. You can get, if you're watching us live, uh, you can get all future live episodes by being where you are right now. But if you're listening to or watching us later on the podcast, you can get in on this earlier by inter- and interact with us by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. You can just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkable.com, excuse me, remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn so that you can get into the action sooner. Now, if you're with us live, I hope that you'll imagine, maybe you won't have to imagine, that you're joining us for a cup of coffee. Just share your questions, your comments, and your ideas. All of them will make for a better conversation and eventually a better podcast. And of course, It also means that sometimes I don't even get to ask my questions because we talk about yours instead. I am so glad that you're here, however or whenever you're with us. Today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Master Classes. Each month, we release a new skill in an advanced masterclass format designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill or to get discounts each month can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. And with that, I'm going to introduce to you our guest today. No longer shall I make you wait. Her name is Susan McPherson. Let me tell you about her. She is a serial connector, a seasoned communicator, and the founder and CEO of McPherson Strategies, a communications consultancy focused on the intersection of brands and social impact. She is the author of The Lost Art of Connecting, the Gather, Ask, and Do Method for Building Meaningful Relationships. Susan has over 25 years of experience in marketing, public relations, and sustainability communications, speaking regularly at industry conferences, probably virtually right now, and is contributing to the Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and Forbes. She has appeared on NPR, CNN, the USA Today, uh, The New Yorker, New York Magazine, and the LA Times. She resides in Brooklyn, and right now, she is my guest live. Susan, welcome. I am so excited to be here, Kevin, and I want to bottle your energy and your effervescence. It's truly magical. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. I I don't know if it's bottleable or if anyone would buy (laughs) it, but I suppose if they would, I'd probably try. Um, So you you say it in the book, and it's the first part of the bio that you sent me that I edited a little, uh, and it says you are a serial connector. So what does that mean? And how did you become that? Well, interestingly enough, I am the prodigy or child of two serial connectors who um, had the ability to connect people across the miles using a, or both their manual typewriters and a rotary telephone. Um, And that was my formative years. Basically, every morning at the breakfast table, I would literally buy for real estate because they would have the five local newspapers spread out, plus yesterday's New York Times and yesterday's Boston Globe, because it would take, you know, a day or two to get to upstate New York where I grew up. And they would be clipping clipping and cutting, uh, essentially, and then going to their manual typewriters and putting little missives out into the world saying, thinking of you, Cousin Harry, thinking of you, Reporter John, my mother did PR for public television, or in my father's case, he was a professor for 40 years at a women's college, and he would stay in touch with not only students, but their daughters, who he would then have, and then their granddaughters, all through the U.S. mail. So I just assumed this is what everyone did. Ah, you were incorrect. 
<laughs> but in my 20s and 30s and 40s, I literally, it was my pride and joy to make introductions, to watch the magic happen when you introduce people. And I'll just tell you the serial connector and that, that moniker came from a retreat that I went with eight dear friends on for a weekend. And our goal that weekend was to come up with our elevator speeches or be able to articulate our superpowers. And at the end of that weekend, I said, hi, I'm Susan McPherson, I'm a serial connector. But I almost peed in my pants because it sounded so ridiculous. But now 16 years later, I wrote a book on it. So yeah, and, and so let's <laughs> talk about that. Um, the lost art of connecting. Here it is, everybody. And you can see I have post it notes, which means I've already got stuff that I love. Um, so um, I, I you know, your your consultancy isn't really about this directly. You you help with brands and sort of stuff. So, so what, what did you do to write the book? Um, well, a couple of things. A lot of people who see the title assume it was a response to the pandemic, right? You know, because we've been so isolated. But actually, the book was conceived four years ago. And my... Um, my thesis was we had lost the humanity in connecting. What had happened is we became slaves to the clicks and the likes and the followers that our technology allowed. And we, instead of actually meaningfully connecting and following through, it was literally just this kind of uh, urgent need to continue to get that self gratification. And quite frankly, I, I, myself included, I thought there's something wrong here. We need to get back that humanity that my parents so doofully did every day. Well, and so you, you wrote this book, and then you know, sort of like our book, the longest coming out in the middle of this thing. Um, you know, it came out at sort of this fortuitous time. I want to talk more about sort of your your lessons and your advice sort of from pandemic and event. But for those of you that are alive, if you have questions, or you just want to say hello, or you just want to tell the serial connector where you're from, you can do anything. Like, I'll put her on the spot and say, who do you know who's in town? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, I, I want to talk about the core of the book. I mean, you, you talked about sort of the heart of the book yeah. just now. But the core of the book is, is in the subtitle. It's the three-part process. It's gather, ask, and do. And and obviously you can't unpack it all for us, but right. tell people a little bit about the three-step process, yep. if you would. Absolutely. And for anyone in the audience who's ever written a business book, and you know this, Kevin, you have to have a methodology, right? So I did some deep soul searching, um, putting together the, the initial kind of framework for the book, because um, 95% of the business from my firm over the last eight years has been inbound. So that taught me that what I had been doing all these years actually was something. Um, there was some forethought in all of it. So the gather phase, which is the first phase, the most important thing you need to do is assess what is meaningful, what is a meaningful relationship to you? Meaning do some deep set like thinking because for every single person, it's different. Two, what are your hopes and dreams and goals over the next four years, four months, even four weeks? And who is it that you want to connect with or reconnect with that is gonna help you meet those goals, but also how you can be helpful to them? And also within the gather phase, what are your superpowers that you can be helpful to others with? Because the underlying theme of the entire book literally turns networking on its head by leading with how can I be of help rather than what can I get? And lastly, within Gather is to do everything that you humanly possibly can, if that makes sense, to break that hermetically sealed bubble, to connect with people who aren't just like you, look like you, sound like you, same age as you, same race and culture as you. Um, because we know we need for our own betterment, for our own society's better, betterment, and to help us in business, right? We need to understand people who are different from us. Um, so that's the gather phase. The ask phase is learning to ask the meaningful questions of others. To before learn you go on, yeah, yeah, of I'm gonna stop you. I should have stopped you before you started on ask because yeah. I wanted to make a comment. Of course. Uh, I actually was gonna ask you to tell us that critical question in a minute, but I wanna go back and underline it, underline it because there are people that are listening I need you to hear that question. How can I be of help to you? 
issues on my end or your end Susan, you getting now I can't yeah I, I'm, I'm having very a lot of difficulties hearing you okay uh, well I'm that makes it hard for me to ask you questions yes, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no it's not your fault it's it's the internet fault uh, yeah it's all garbled we're not going to continue. Um, and so if you're watching me, not Susan, if you're watching me, give me a quick comment if you can hear me. Yeah, cutting in and out. Oh, they can hear Susan, but not me. See, how about that? So apparently <laughs> Kevin is the problem. Um, can you hear me now? You're good now. Okay, well, we're going to continue and we're going to let uh, Marissa, edit this out in the post related to the to the podcast. Uh, but I, I want to go back and what I was saying was that now we're saying, no, they can't. Hopefully it's getting better. It looks like maybe on my end it's better. Um, so I want to underline that question. How can I help or how can I be of help? And as I don't know that you heard me saying it or not, um, Susan, but in a, a whole bunch of ways that question has has shown up in my life in the last few days and it was sort of the the exclamation point was put on it as 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 the core idea really in many ways of this book and so i want to thank you for that i want to make sure everyone heard that before we left gather as as to really focus on that idea and i love this question the other question that you asked which was uh, what does meaningful mean to you yeah that is fabulous mm -hmm. i mean that's a fabulous question yeah. Um, so you told us about gather. So let's talk about ask and do talk about ask. Sure. Sure. And, and thank you so much for repeating. Um, you know, we've all, after 15 months of this kind of crazy vortex world we're living in, we've gotten used to technical difficulties and just ride them through. Right. Um, it, 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 it doesn't ruin everything. Um, the ask section is all about learning to ask the meaningful questions of others that gives you a sense of their hopes and dreams and desires and wants. And if you listen carefully, which I learned we are woefully bad at, myself included, but then we get to go to the favorite phase that I like to live in, and that is the do phase. And that's where you become trustworthy, reliable, helpful, all the things that you can be, because we are all able, no matter who we are, what role we have professionally or what you know what our likes and dislikes are we all have the means to be helpful to others so that is kind of the very thirty thousand foot view of gather as do and obviously we can dive in and discuss more but as as mentioned earlier that underlying notion is leading with how we can be helpful so um when you think of traditional networking notice i didn't name the book the lost art of networking i see a very delineate or a a delineation between networking and connecting. And connecting to me has that word intentionality associated with it. It has that word meaningful associated with it. And of course, leading with how can we be supportive of others? Not in giving up who we are and not in not helping ourselves, but I fervently believe if we help others, the help comes back. That's interesting because that's, I think, if we if we go to when people first talk about networking, are you losing me again? I'm afraid you are. Um, when people first thought about networking, that's what they meant. That's just not what it's become. And that's exactly. the problem. Right? That's the problem. So if you love that word, I don't think you're saying don't use the word. I think hearing you is critical, though, yeah. about what you mean when you're saying all yeah. this. Right? Well, um, I'm not anti-networking. I mean, we all have to do it and we will have to do it. But 
there's ways to make networking more meaningful and help turn it into connecting. And that re that relates to a phrase I think you made up. I mean, I, I never heard it until in the book. What do you mean by that? Oh, <laughs> um, well, many of us in life have experienced FOMO, fear of missing out. And I think I first learned it in high school when I would come back on a Monday and learn about all the parties I didn't get invited to. Um, but professionally, we all know we need to be at various places, various venues, uh, and sometimes we don't get those invitations, right? So years ago, when I was in a business development role in a territory that didn't know the company I was working for, I realized I needed to create JOMO, not the joy of missing out, but the joy of meeting others. And I started very small, inviting the three people I knew in the industry I was working in, in the respective territory, which was in Southern California, which I grew up in upstate New York. I mean, I was a fish out of water, but I started in, with three others and literally two weeks later asked everyone to bring each bring two people. And within six months, we had about 120 people professionally. So that was a classic example of you don't have to do all the inviting but it is a great way to deal with the fear of missing out. But don't look at it as the joy of missing out. Look at it as the joy of meeting others. The joy of meeting others. Okay, I was going to ask this later, but I really, I don't think I can wait any longer. <laughs> Susan, what if I'm an introvert? Because some people are saying, yes, but Susan, yes, yeah. but Susan, you don't know. I, I'm not like you. I'm an introvert. Like, what is your advice? I know you talk about it in the book, but what's your advice here? Because I think it's important. Of course it is. Of course it is. And I, you know, I have fantasies that in my next life, I will be an introvert just so I can experience it. But, um, I those, think, you see those as positive. I mean, I don't, I maybe do. I don't want to know that. Um, no, there's lots of positive. And actually in part of the book, I talk about a few senior executives over my career that I have witnessed them being introverts and being very successful in how they connect. Absolutely. hundred um, percent. And I think first of all, taking out that, that, you know, moving from networking to connecting, first of all, is more feasible because you're not looking at one to 100 or one to 50. You're looking at more one to one, one to two. And when I was previously discussing the whole JOMO model, I'm not expecting you to be the one inviting everyone, right? You know, the power of asking others to connect. But I like to, um, before, we ha before you have events, whether they're online or in person, do some, a little bit of strategic reconnaissance. Find out, and we have many tools to do this nowadays, we can find out who's gonna be in the room beforehand. So do a little kind of pre-event research to find out who intentionally do you want to meet? And go with what I call the event triumvirate, where you literally meet three people, learn three things, and share three things, meaning open up a little bit, but also learn, listen, and meet then you can go hide in the bathroom. But to me, that is feasible, manageable, doable. And if you're an introvert, it's, it, it, you can actually do that. Um, the other, another suggestion would be, if you can find out ahead of time who's gonna be there, find the super connector in the room, okay? And then kind of draft off them, the same way you would draft off somebody who is biking in front of you. Um, but the most important thing is, if you lead with, asking people questions about them, then you can just sit back and listen. So you don't have to do all the talking like I'm doing right now. So I'm going to And that's exactly, that's exactly right. Because, and, and so, you know, um, actually in my experience, uh, and it's like you, Susan, it's not me, uh, but in my experience, those who are more introverted are actually better in, in some ways in this regard because yeah. they don't feel like they have to keep talking because they don't want to. Where people like you and I might just keep on <laughs> on. Um, so, so uh, you said something interesting in the book, and I don't, I mean, I didn't mark it, I, I can't pull to it exactly, but you made a point that I think is useful. And I, and I want to say it for everybody, not just for the introverts. And the point is, we've all had to go into this meeting, go into this session in this conference, go into this networking event, whatever, and been freaked out or scared or whatever. And we think we're the only one and it's most everybody. And, and just that one thing, knowing that, yeah. and then saying it's not 100, it's finding three, yeah. right? It's starting with one person. I, I think changes the whole dynamic for us. Yeah, and also I, I have found, and 
No, and believe me, I get nervous too, and I want to hide in the bathroom sometimes. But when you see somebody standing or sitting by themselves, chances are if you walk up and introduce yourself, they that person's going to, and I, I mean, this is a generalization, not every person, but that person most likely will breathe a, a sigh of relief because that person won't be alone anymore. So for you to be afraid to go up and talk to somebody, I would suggest that that is the time to do that. Um, it's the hu it's a humane thing to do. It's kind, it's compassionate. And quite frankly, we need more of that in this world. Yeah, I would agree with that. So um, you, you talk about a couple of other tools that I think are really useful. I mean, I really love that we've talked about sort of the mindset and the perspective of all this. And you've given us some very practical things to consider to consider here. But you also talk about something that you call the five minute ask. So we're really now we're in the ask phase. We're not just in gather. Uh, and, and so describe for us what you call the five minute ask. Sure, sure. Well, just a reminder, the overall section is about learning to ask others meaningful question. But obviously, given the subject matter, it's also about how do we ask for help? Right. And and I'm, you know, from a woman's perspective sometimes, and again, generalization, but we tend to not necessarily ask for what we want, what we deserve, um, what is rightfully ours for the taking, so to speak. So to me, if we can become better at asking for help, we will all be, you know, better off. But I fervently believe that it should be, you know, don't make the big ask, have little asks along the way, because then the person you are asking of has a vested interest in your success. And then it is a much more reciprocal thing because you can make an ask with an offer to help along the way. Right. And, you know, for those in the audience, how many, I wish I could see a show of hands, but, you know, how many of us have connected with somebody on LinkedIn and within two hours, they respond by trying to sell us something rather than taking that opportunity to say, great to meet, meet you, congratulations on, you know, something because they can find out by looking at your feed or maybe looking at your Instagram or your Twitter feed. And then maybe offering up just a little bit of, oh, you know, I happen to know somebody on the board of, or I happen to have a friend who lives in your hometown, you know, it's just something because that will like change the dynamic. And then of course they can sell you something. But I just think it's like, you know, when I, was coming of age professionally, Kevin, and you probably know this, when we needed to research people before we met them, we had the Yellow Pages and the Encyclopedia Britannica. And now you have everything at your disposal. Yeah. Yes, you do. And so Marina, I mean, I, I was chuckling when you said, I wish I could see a show of hands. You don't need to see a show of hands because you know <laughs> it's everybody, right? Uh, and so, you know, it's the whole thing of uh, we really need to like get to know people before yes. we ask them out on ask them out to get married, right? Let's right. Go, hey, hey, you know we don't need to go all the way there before we even have had any conversation, right? So uh, I think that's really really fantastic. And yeah, I wanted to talk about the five that the five minute ask, but because the end of at the end of this, if we're going to create meaningful business relationships, it's got to be reciprocal both directions, right? So I really wanted to have you talk about that a little bit more. You mentioned this earlier as well. You talked about what you call in the book, the 444, although you just went right through it as you made it like in a sentence. But can you unpack this for people just a little sure, bit? Sure. Well, you know, it's, it, it, you know, you've heard me say a couple of times this intentionality and the importance to be intentional. I mean, there's, you know, eight to 10 billion people on this planet. We don't need to connect with all of them. And it is this notion of, you know, what are the goals and hopes and dreams that we have? And I, I said it earlier, over four years, over four months, even over four weeks, and then be very intentional. And I, I would go so far as say, you know, this very strange time we're living in where we all have a shared vulnerability. Um, you know, everyone has been affected by this horrific pandemic. Some obviously at a much more horrific um, level than others, but nevertheless, it is almost like a great equalizer. Um, you know, I'm certainly not complimenting it in any way, but that shared vulnerability gives us this kind of commonality among the uncommonality. So it, I would go so far as say, it's a very good time to be thinking, hmm, you know, I have a reset opportunity. When in life have I really had that, you know, that kind of, 
you know, few months to kind of like, hmm, what is it that I want to happen in the next couple of years? And I, I think we're seeing that. I think people are making, you know, to career changes, career decisions. Um, but I think it's also a time to really think about who do we want to reconnect with? Who do we want to connect with? How do we want to expand our bubbles? Um, you know, I, I joke, but a fish can't see water unless it breaks out of its bowl. So yeah, we can't see that. Right. Exactly. So, so I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the pandemic um, and, and you've, you've taken us there. So let's just do that for a second. So what would you say? I mean, you've asked a bunch of great questions for us to consider, right? Yeah. That the pandemic sort of puts in front of us and, and, and seeing it as uh, not just a challenge, but as an opportunity, which I agree with 100%. Um, as, but specifically as a connector, uh, what can we learn having lived through this or coming out of it to be a better connector? Yeah, well, um, number one, you know, it, it, coming out of it, First of all, I would suggest that everybody in the room give themselves grace and there is no rush. Meaning I, I feel, you know, this, this, we, we all of a sudden were like masks off. It's okay. Let's rush to get together. And for people who were introverted, I'm sure it was terrifying because for even people like myself, it was kind of like, oh, wait a minute. And I think it's important to honor what we've been through. Um, and for many of us could still be going through. So, but I also think Never before have we realized how important our connections are because for 15 months, most of us couldn't get together and see one another and, and see loved ones. So my hope is going forward, even though we have short term memories, um, my hope is when we are back in some, some semblance of normalcy, whatever that normalcy is, I would imagine it's going to be an unnormalcy, normalcy, but I think like, I'm hoping we don't stand there when we're talking to people, looking at our email or looking over people's shoulders to find somebody more interesting or more connected um, and rather really just listen and learn from one another, no matter what position each of us holds in society. Um, and I know I sound very Pollyanna-ish and, 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 and I definitely am an optimistic human, but I think you know the lessons learned, I hope don't go away. Um, the good news is the technology has enabled us to stay connected, but I just hope that it doesn't replace human connection. Well, you know, since you mentioned the yellow pages, this makes this safe. I, I've been telling people like, imagine if this had happened when all we had was a fax machine. Exactly. I well, mean, and, you can't imagine it as, yeah. as, as challenging and difficult and everything, whatever, whatever adjectives you want to use that this has been, yeah. imagine yeah. what it would have done. To our world, if all we had was a fax machine and a telephone, I mean, seriously, yeah, it would have been. I, I every degrees, I, it would have been, wow. it would have been, you know, exponentially more impactful uh, in so many ways uh, than I mean, societally and individually as it has been as it as it was. So l let's just talk about that for a second. This isn't a book about social media, and 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 yet as we're doing this live. That's where it's live, right? It's on YouTube, it's on Facebook, it's on LinkedIn right now. And, and you did mention a little bit about what, you know, what you might do if someone, if you, if you reach out to connect with someone on LinkedIn, but do you have any other advice um, uh, around connecting as it relates to social media? Sure, sure. Well, the beautiful thing is we have all these platforms, right? I'm not suggesting people get on all of them, but find a couple that they're comfortable with but be intentional when you are reaching out to people on these various platforms. The other thing I have found very helpful over the last few years when I meet people either virtually or in person is ask them what platform they prefer to communicate on. Is it text? Is it WhatsApp? Is it email? Is it phone? Is it a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn? And then make a note of that in your, you know, whatever device you use. Because to me, if the holy grail is getting a response and continuing the conversation, well, then make it easy for the other person, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting if they're on a platform you're not, that you completely have to, you know, majorly, you know, <laughs> change your life. Well, please, I was going to say, can I limit the number of choices I give them? Because, yeah, yeah. but but I think your point is a really good one. I, I, I say that to leaders about the team all the time, like, 
there there's always a best tool for a given communication situation. And yet I'm going to lean into the preferences of my team members if it doesn't matter. Right. And, and I hadn't really thought about it in terms of, you know, outside of my team. And, I, but I think it's a really, really great point. It I think is it's a great and point. If somebody told you they were a vegan. You wouldn't suggest you go have dinner at, you know, Ruth Chris steakhouse. Right. I mean, <laughs> it just, it's like, yeah. Um, and again, if the ultimate goal is to continue the reciprocity, to continue the conversation, or you have an ask, you want to do what you can to make it as simple and easy for the other person. Um, and, you know, somebody wants, wants and, and oh, let me back up. Optimum is in person. I mean, I will just say that. And obviously we have had challenges over, over the last 15 months doing so. Um, but I do believe in person for very deep or Difficult conversations is the way to go. Um, if that isn't possible, pick up the damn phone. Because in the research I learned for the book, I can't tell you how many times we misinterpret electronic communications. And sometimes the best way to clarify and to put everyone at ease is just pick up the phone if you can't actually have the conversation in real life. We could we could drop the mic right there, except my mic is on the on the desk, so I can't <laughs> Uh, that would be that would be enough. Is there anything, Susan, that you wished I would have asked, or that I you think I should have asked, or that you just want to mention before we start to move into sort of the the, the home stretch here? Sure. Well, I think it's in, I think sometimes people are like, well, why does connecting matter? And I have to tell you again, in the research I learned, a connected workforce is a more productive workforce. So if you run a company or run a business or run a nonprofit, it is to your advantage to make space for your employees to connect more than at the annual sales conference or the monthly Zoom happy hour, okay? So actually make it part of the professional development because your company will succeed in, in, in you know, financially and, and reap the rewards of happy employees. Second, from a health perspective, you know, and again, barring other, you know, other issues we may have hand, but if we make connecting a meaningful part of our lives, we, again, all things being equal, will live longer in an even greater, um, in even greater spades than if we ate kale every day and ran every day. So to me, if you needed an incentive to want to be a better connector, to me, that's a really good, good um, thing to think about. Strong, strong social network adds what 15 years to our life, everything else being equal. That's better than kale, better than stopping smoking. Um, so <laughs> there you go. So, so Susan, I, I know, I know part of this answer, uh, but no one else does. I mean, no one else is, is with us right now knows. What do you do for fun? Well, I have a remarkable dog named Phoebe, who is now back at my side. Uh, she just had ACL surgery in May and she was in upstate New York, about three hours north. So she came home. So lots of just play time with her. Um, one thing, I'm a huge traveler. And this past 15 months, obviously, that has been put on hold. But in January of 2020, I went to Antarctica. And I honestly can't wait to go back. So um, that gives you a little bit of uh, my wanderlust. I love that. So hopefully in another year, I can get back on the road and do, go to some pretty wild and amazing places. I do not know. If we've had a guest, I've never had a guest tell me that they've been to Antarctica. So there's oh. one of the firsts. I love that. that you've got Susan here. Uh, so a question. The only thing I told you I was going to ask you, uh, what are you reading these days? I'm um, just about to finish um, a beautiful book called Somebody's Daughter um, by Ashley C. Ford. Uh, it, it is, it will bring tears and joy and everything to, to your heart and your mind. Highly, highly recommended. Somebody's daughter. And I'm going to recommend that you all get a copy of The Lost Art of Connecting um, it, by the lovely and talented Susan McPherson. I, I want to just say three things about the book. There are three words in the title that are the three things that make, that, that set this book apart and that tell you along with listening to this, what you need to know about this book, the word art, the word connecting and the word meaningful. So those are the three words to me that matter the most in relationship to this book. You ought to get a copy. Where can they, where can, where can they learn more about your work? Where can they get a copy of this book? Well, you Don't can get a copy at any of your favorite bookstores or anywhere online. 
Um, and the website for the book is thelostartofconnecting.com. My company, which is a social impact communications firm, is McPherson Strategies. So it's mcpstrategies.com. And you can find me on all the interwebs at Susan McP1. And by all means, I'm, I'm open. I love feedback, suggestions, recommendations, and ideas of how you all connect, especially in this kind of rather unusual times we're living in. All right, Susan, thank you for being here. We're not quite done. I've got a question now for everybody else. No more questions for you, Susan, but now the question <laughs> for everyone else, whether you're live or whether you're listening later, is now what? What actions are you going to take? Are you going? Do you have a new strategy for the next time you're in a physical space with a bunch of other humans in that it's often called networking? Do you have a new strategy for thinking about what you might do differently on social media? Do you have a new appreciation for the importance of connections for you in your work and in your life? What, those are just a couple of the things that I wrote down. Or are you just going to go out and ask yourself and ask others, how can I be of help? Whatever it is, if you don't take some action from this, what was the point? I mean, we're, we're enjoyable to, to listen to, of course. But the reality is none of this matters unless you go take action. I hope that you'll do that. Susan, thanks again so much for being here. It was such a pleasure to have you. Kevin, it was such a joy. Really, truly, thank you. And thank you for um, having me as a guest. It was a pleasure. We worked on doing this. We had to de delay it. I'm glad we didn't have to delay any longer. So everybody, I hope that you found this of value. If you did, tell somebody else to join us. And if you did, you know I'll be back next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.